Hi everyone, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, the idea of this presentation is to give you an overview of the many different economic dimensions of the Libra design and also to misspell a few myths. I think there's a lot of confusion uh, and uh, you know, uh, misperception about what the project is really about. Some of the dimensions uh, I think are currently misunderstood and so my, my goal here is to try to clarify at a very high level uh, you know, what is the design behind it and what are the intentions uh, behind both the project and, and kind of the protocol. Uh, of course, I'll be talking on behalf of Calibra, but as many of you probably know, uh, as of uh, October 14th, the project is now being passed on after having been incubated within Facebook uh, to the Libra Association, which is a nonprofit. Uh, I'll tell you a bit more about that, with 21 founding members, of which about 20% are NGOs and universities. Um, so a lot of work to be done, uh, but really excited to see this thing that was incubated uh, for, for about a year, a bit more than a year, within Facebook being passed on to a much broader uh, or organizational and, gov and government body. <clears throat> so uh, when I decided to you know, take a leave from MIT to work full time on this, it became really clear after having studied the economics of cryptocurrency uh, since 2013, uh, I co-designed the research study around the Bitcoin experiment at MIT, that you know, the cryptocurrency space was really proposing a new model for trust in digital platforms. And I think you know, how that model is applied to different use cases, uh, to different types of problems, really depends on what you're trying to do. And so you know, when, when you're approaching Libra, I'll ask you to uh, approach it with an open mind and to try to, and try to keep in mind you know, what, what are we trying to solve for? Uh, what is kind of the, the problem uh, that the network is trying to address? And why did we have to make the compromises that we made, both from an engineering perspective, but also from an economics perspective? Uh, why am I talking about trust? Uh, it's because, you know, at its core, uh, what blockchain really allows you to do, you know, as an economist, to me, blockchain really presents a new opening in terms of the market design solutions uh, that we can bring to market. Uh, so there's this really interesting intersection between cryptography, computer science, and economics that allows you to design markets, to design digital platforms in ways that weren't even conceivable before. And as you start shifting some of those trade-offs, uh, you know, things that were too expensive, uh, too slow, too inefficient, um, that created too much concentration uh, in, a, in a handful of players, uh, can be really redesigned under a new lens. <clears throat> When we thought about the economics of blockchain, uh, this was actually quite early, in, around 2016, it became clear that there were at least two fundamental economic costs that are affected by the technology. And I think we spend a lot of time talking about the first one, which we call the cost of verification. So the ability to verify that you know, a digital attribute, uh, a piece of digital information is accurate and it's kind of uh, what, what you expect it to be. Uh, but we talk a bit less about the second dimension, which has actually much broader uh, implication for competition and market power. I'll get, I'll get back to that. We call this the, the cost of networking. So if you think about the first dimension as the ability to verify state and rely on that state as you're performing some operations in the real world or in society, the second one is the ability to reward state transition that are particularly valuable from a network perspective or from a societal perspective. So you can, for example, like in proof of work models, reward miners for providing security and infrastructure to new decentralized network. Uh, but you can use those rewards, those incentives, to start designing all types of new marketplaces and new types of digital platforms. That's the part that's, you know, as an economist, is particularly exciting to me uh, about blockchain and, and cryptocurrency, which is that we, we can think about, uh, you know, those, those state transition, the goals that we're trying to achieve as an ecosystem, as a group of uh, players uh, within, within a digital platform, and, and then design around some of the challenges that you typically see when you're bringing together a bunch of actors with different intentions. Uh, you may have heard about you know, tragedy of the commons, when there's essentially underinvestment in, 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 in the public utility layer. Uh, I think a lot of layer one solutions suffer from this kind of race towards uh, appropriating on layer two and underinvesting on, on those public rails. Uh, so all these economic issues uh, turn out to have solutions that you know, go back a long history in the economic literature, and I think more interaction between cryptographers, computer scientists, and economists on the other side are really needed uh, to make progress on some of these dimensions. 
When I think about the cost of networking, uh, what really matters to me is the ability to design an ecosystem or a digital platform where no single entity can unilaterally change the rules of the game, expropriate other players, or essentially you know, shift revenues and returns in a way that's favorable to them. And when you take this concept to, I think, a lot of the experiments that you've seen in this space, I think people are experimenting with different tweaks around the same concept. Uh, sometimes, you know, it's, it's shifted more towards uh, ideas of censorship resistance or other concepts that I think are very popular in this space. But depending on the problem you're trying to solve, that's still a quite valuable insight uh, from an economics perspective. And, and, and the basic intuition there is that, you know, you can take a market where there's not a lot of competition, where there's eye switching cost, uh, where there's eye barriers to entry, and you can open that market up to new entrants, startups, new types of players, and allow for a higher degree of competition. And you'll see that a lot of that has permeated uh, the design of, of Libra. <clears throat> there's at least three key economic objectives in the basic design uh, around Libra, at least from an economics perspective. The first one, I think, is the one that you uh, have probably heard a lot about, which is trust in an efficient medium of exchange. Um, you know, when, when I started studying cryptocurrencies, one of the key uh, obstacles to wider adoption, uh, at least in this phase, has been the wide uh, pr price fluctuations. And so if we wanted to create something that people could rely on, on day one, as an efficient medium of exchange, we had to make some trade-offs, and we had to make some choices to ensure that the token, Libra, could be used, again, for payments uh, from the very beginning. And so you'll see the choices that we made behind that are really targeted at that use case, allowing someone to send value across the globe instantaneously with low friction, uh, and essentially in a marketplace that's gonna be also extremely competitive. And I'll get to that uh, a bit later in the presentation. The second dimension is trust in the protocol, of course, right? And this is where a lot of the uh, crypto economics, but also the protocol and consensus work is making a lot of progress on in, in the broader ecosystem. And the more important dimension, this was actually something that was not obvious when we started thinking about the problem, is making sure that the resulting marketplace for financial services on top of Libra could be the most competitive that you could ever see. Uh, you know, there's, there's a number of different approaches to, to consensus, and they have different trade-offs in terms of the market that they create on top of them. Where does concentration re-emerge? You know, sometimes it could be concentration in terms of mining. Sometimes it could be if you're, if you're basing things on stake, uh, you know, people that have a lot of stake accumulating more stake. And so if you really want to ensure that the system at scale, in equilibrium, allows you to be distributed and as decentralized as possible, those are things that you kind of need to keep in mind. The last one, which is more dynamics, it's more about how the network is gonna evolve over time, is trust in the governance and future evolution of, of the ecosystem. And, and this one is the hardest one to get because you know, it's the one that still relies on offline institutions, on offline forms of governance, and that kind of soft layer between the chain and, and, and real human beings. Um, so I think there's, there's been a lot of thought that has been put into some of the initial governance design, but we're iterating on that to make it even more robust and to really ensure that this network can evolve over time uh, and grow as, as, as its needs uh, essentially evolve. So I'm gonna briefly uh, double click on, on each one of these three, and, and then maybe we'll have a time for, for a few questions. <clears throat> so the first one is trust in an efficient medium of exchange. Now, every choice we made from the very beginning, and again, some trade-offs came with it, was to make sure that Libra could be the most efficient medium of exchange for cross-border transactions that you have access to. Uh, to do that, we need to back that token with something that already has intrinsic value. Many of the other models that don't rely on a, on a backing like the one that we have in the system uh, are essentially fluctuating with expectations. And those expectations can change because of market conditions, because of regulatory responses, because of technical uncertainty. We needed something that uh, would provide users that reliability that if they're sending value today, uh, that, that medium is not, is not kind of losing that value uh, over time. So Libra has intrinsic value from the start. It's not gonna be volatile. And in fact, the, the basket composition is designed to really minimize the volatility relative to any possible uh, different jurisdiction or country. Now, of course, you, you know, some people have called this a global stable coin. Well, that's, that's an oxymoron, right? You can't really build a global stable coin. Uh, an asset cannot be globally stable in different jurisdictions where people have different needs, they buy different goods, and they're interacting with all sort of different economic conditions. Uh, the goal of the Libra Reserve is really value preservation. 
ensuring that over a long period of time, the assets that back each token are assets that have a track record of stability, the central banks behind it have a track record of independence, and have been able also to conduct a monetary policy that is not inflationary. And that's kind of a short list, uh, and that's why you see you know, the five initial proposed assets in, in that basket. Now what's interesting is that the design uh, also mitigates the classic reasons for, for kind of a run uh, on the reserve. Every coin is redeemable for the value of the underlying asset, including the, the very last one. Uh, and we wanted that feature to really ensure that there was no reason in the market, uh, in a change, again, because of a change in expectations, because of a change in market conditions, to, to have a kind of a massive outflow uh, of users from, from Libra. Now, something that I think is uh, fundamentally misunderstood about the project is that Libra is designed to complement fiat currencies. It's designed to extend their functionality and to add all sort of new programmable uh, features to it. It's not designed to displace the dollar or to displace any other currency. Uh, it's, a it's actually designed you know, for a future where you could already imagine central banks' digital currencies being available and them being integrated in the Libra Reserve streamlining operations. So keep that in mind as, as you think about the project. Um, the assets behind the Libra Reserve are already available today in, in countries that don't have capital controls. And so there's, there's really no change in, in money supply. Uh, Libra doesn't entail any money creation, right? So every token is fully backed by assets that are managed, governed, and controlled by central banks. And um, the reserve, which is kind of this critical trust component, will have a very narrow mandate. So part of the licensing regime under which the reserve will operate will really pre preclude things that you may be worried about, like fractionalization. The idea is to ensure that that full backing is there, it's maintained over time, and, and cannot be reversed. Uh, that man mandate will also be you know, always targeted at value preservation. The idea is that you know, when, when economic conditions change, uh, there's not gonna be people at the reserve making bets on, on what the market may look like. Uh, it's meant to be something extremely stable and, and not actively managed. Now, what's key here is that the reserve really doesn't have any discretion in monetary policy. So if you think about you know, classic uh, trilemmas in, in, in macro about what you can and cannot do, uh, this looks a lot like a currency board. Uh, tokens are issued when there's demand. Tokens are destroyed when you know, people want to redeem them for, for, for fiat. And so the reserve is just responding to market conditions. Supply expands when there's demand for more coins and contracts in the, in the other way around. And that was a design that gave us really that guarantee that as you scale this to you know, potentially millions and, and the later uh, billions of people, uh, we had a design that could be robust to all sort of a very, very extreme market condition. Now what's interesting is that, uh, although you may, you may have read about you know, all sorts of different worries uh, from a central bank perspective, the change that Libra may bring, even at scale, especially at scale, are changes that have been going on for many years. They're not different than you know, some of the changes that you've seen because of the digitization of payment systems. Essentially some of these tokens, by being digital, may pass hands more rapidly than they used to be uh, passed before. That's an increase in the velocity uh, of money. Uh, again, it's nothing new, it's just an acceleration of a trend uh, that, that was already present for, for many years. <clears throat> now, there's a lot that we're doing uh, iterating on the design, and again, this was incubated within Facebook, uh, but key uh, really to the mission and governance, as you will see, I'll talk a bit more about that, is that now this is not uh, a process that is uh, you know, governed by Facebook, it's gonna be controlled by the, by the association, so the entire body of participants. Uh, so there's a number of work stream uh, at the association looking at the design of the reserve, how to make it even more uh, compliant and, and kind of integrate with some of the re regulations uh, and requirements that a network of this scale uh, will have to comply with. Uh, thinking about you know, issues for, like fighting financial crime on the network in a way that is compatible uh, with, with what you know, different governments expect. Uh, and also thinking about what does this network look like uh, in a way that you know, if you're in an, an emerging economy, you see this as, as something that can actually lower the cost of remittance, uh, not, not as a threat. Um, again, a lot of work going on on, on, on that and, and I think a few iterations on, on some of the reserve policy uh, based on a lot of the feedback that we received essentially from, from all over the globe. 
on the, on the second dimension, so moving away from, from the currency itself and, and from the token, um, talking about a bit more about the, the protocol and, and you know, the resulting market uh, for financial services. Uh, we, we looked at a number of you know, uh, models, uh, of course, including the most established in the industry. And one of the challenges we saw, for example, with, with proof of work as applied to something like Libra was that Within proof of work, if you think about the key strength of proof of work is civil resistance and, and the fact that you know, one miner is, is the same as another miner. Uh, it doesn't really matter who you are. Now, that word where you don't have any information about who's, who's kind of protecting and, and running the network is, is very efficient for some solutions. Uh, but in this case, actually leads to concentration. And so for Libra, that concentration was something that we wouldn't have wanted in the system. So the idea is to build um, a slightly different model uh, that actually takes advantage of something economists have been studying for a long time, which is kind of the role of relational contracts. Uh, many of the entities that will be operating on the Libra blockchain are established institutions and over time, you know, new startups and new entrants. Uh, these are institutions that are, are consumer facing, uh, that people identify and that have a brand and reputation to, to withhold over time. Now, it turns out that that's, that's actually an asset when you're designing a protocol of that type. Because, you know, if you look at the founding members beyond, uh, you know, the, what, what could be the fees that they may be collecting as validators on the network, if they're founding members, their reputation is actually on the line in making sure that the network is secure and can be defended uh, under an attack. So it's really a process for bootstrapping uh, a, a new network by, by kind of borrowing trust and reputation from, from the offline, offline world. Um, the, the other drawback of, of proof of work that, that didn't really fit kind of our, our particular use case is that if you think about, you know, in proof of work, you're mostly rewarding miners uh, for performing wasteful computation. Uh, and, you know, when you have incentives rewarding wasteful computation, what you get on the other side is a lot of wasteful computation. Uh, so it becomes very difficult in a proof of work network to reward miners for anything but uh, performing uh, that wasteful computation. And so if you're thinking about over time improvements in quality, improvements in the functionality of the network, uh, we, we didn't want a situation where, you know, a counterparty could, could stop some of those developments because they didn't align with their own revenue function. Uh, and again, one of the key worries we had is that a proof of work network would lead to substantial concentration in mining and that would kind of potentially uh, diminish the ability for, for a tri thriving ecosystem of competing services on top of it. Uh, so, you know, we have a paper that goes a lot, to, a lot more into the details of this, but the basic intuition is that uh, if you can take advantage of relational contracts, first of all, you know, you, you don't need the wasteful computation component, uh, but also you can evolve the network in a slightly different way. And again, we're not saying this is the solution to every possible blockchain application, but in the case of Libra, we thought this was actually a, a pretty reasonable compromise in terms of the, the trade-offs that, that it posed. Um, so, you know, when you think about Libra, think about a system that is bootstrapped and secured by the trusted brands that are coming around the table at the beginning, and then opens up over time as the network progresses. And so that's, that's where really the, the, the opening of the network is actually a key, a, a key part of this, and I, I'll talk about it in, in a second. Uh, so these are the initial founding members, there's 21. Again, about 20% of them are NGOs or universities. Uh, many of these, when, when you look at the list, are entities that uh, would benefit from a network like Libra existing at scale. And, and so part of the reason why they are founding members is because they believe that you know, if you can lower the cost of moving money across the globe, if you can remove friction, especially in cross-border, that would be a great benefit to, to their own business and, and to their own mission. <clears throat> this is something that it, it's really key to the economic design, which is you know, Libra is not meant to be a wallet garden. And you know, I, I know that some of you, when they see the setup, they immediately think, okay, this looks a lot like a permissioned network, uh, and, and so Wallet Garden is probably the first analogy that would come to mind. Well, there, there's a few key economic tweaks that we did to, to that permission setup that actually make Libra substantially different. The idea is really to encourage competition, encourage entry, and over time to avoid the classic taxi medallion problem, right? You wouldn't want 100 uh, founding members running nodes and then no competition uh, for that market uh, being there because that would be essentially uh, extremely wasteful. The inspiration for, for the Libra Association and some of the design around uh, actually the platform is much more linked to open technology standards. So think about you know, how things are developed around IE, IEEE or IETF. Uh, 
creating things that are true protocols, they're truly interoperable, they're truly open. And, and again, it's gonna be a journey, uh, again, because of the, the permission setup with tweaks uh, uh, that I will talk about in a second. Uh, but the idea is to really ensure a level playing field for all sort of players. This could be you know, tech players, uh, financial incumbents, startups, everyone else should be able to come into the network, operate, build services, build new types of experiences on the same terms. And that's, that's really important to us. Uh, when you look at the current financial system, one of the challenges in really reducing access, uh, so for example, the World Bank has this sustainable development target for remittances. And the goal is to get the price of remittances down to about 3%. Now, it's interesting because the average right now is about 7%. Uh, now, that average is actually masquerading a lot of variants. Uh, so some people pay as much as 20 30%, and, and I know that many people in the audience maybe know this. Um, so just imagine that, that simple transfer of, of digital information in a secure way from A to B, uh, taking away 30% of the value. Uh, that, that's, that's mostly the result of market structure. So the reason why you know, we cannot transfer value today efficiently is not because we don't have the technology to do so, it's because there's opposition uh, because of you know, established interest in, in kind of charging uh, fairly high fees for that very same service. You know, the irony is that often someone would go to a kiosk, uh, pay you know, to, to send a remittance, take a picture, send it over a messaging app, and on the other end, somebody does the same, shows the receipt on a messaging app. So this is kind of already happening over digital messaging, uh, but we would still very high fees. So the, the key tweak to the permission setup uh, was to have very clear open membership criteria. So the idea is like, yes, there's a starting set of members, uh, but there's a very clear algorithm for deciding over time how to expand that membership to more and more entities. And the idea is to really allocate those slots over time to the most competitive and, 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 and functional players. Um, so again, starting with 21, uh, potentially as many as 100 uh, around launch, and, and you know, you'll see many different uh, types of players too. So you know, from telco providers that may be able to work as an on and off ramp in different regions, uh, to merchants that may drive adoption in use cases. Uh, the idea was like really to use this initial set to drive utility into the coin. But at the end of the game, what really matters for the network to succeed is that there will be very high interoperability. If you look at why uh, many of the current systems are expensive, is because they're extremely fragmented, right? So everybody's building their own silent solution. Uh, you know, uh, David uh, used to joke that you know, when he was uh, at PayPal and he worked on the acquisition of Venmo, you know, many years later, Venmo can still not send a payment to, to, to PayPal itself, right? So it's, even within the same company, we do see fragmentation. But beyond that, I, I think we're living in a world of financial uh, wallets and digital services that often don't interoperate uh, because they're trying to keep a captive audience. So a key, key element of Libra is to ensure very high interoperability, low switching costs, so that if you're not happy with one digital wallet, tomorrow you can switch to another one. Or if you're a merchant accepting Libra with one provider, you can switch to a different one tomorrow, you will see no difference. You can still take the very same payments. Um, and that is really needed for, for innovation. Right, because I think to allow startups and new players to come in, you need to allow them to interoperate uh, with, with, with everybody else. The belief is really that you know, by allowing for more competition in financial services, you can drive, for example, the cost of those remittances down from 7% as close as possible to zero. Now, of course, people uh, will raise, okay, there, there's AML and KYC cost, and there's other things that you know, you'll have to replicate on this network to achieve kind of the same functionality. But I think you know, there, there's a broader um, conviction that a lot of those things can be done together with, with new technology in a better way. And so it is possible to reduce cost. It is possible to allow for a pretty broad interoperability uh, in, a, in a fairly effective way. And so again, uh, when, you, when you think about the protocol itself and the governance structure, keep in mind that the fundamental idea was, was really to achieve this idea where you know, no matter which service provider, no matter what your choice is, uh, consumer will have many, many different players to choose from. And this could be on dimensions like price, could be on dimensions like privacy, really allowing different business models to thrive. Uh, some services may decide to charge your subscription fee, some others will be free or subsidized by other means. Uh, you'll see many different players being able to work on the same network and, and offer services in, in many different flavors, and, and that was really important. 
Now, I've talked a bit about the Libra Association. Uh, it's an indep independent, not-for-profit. Uh, it's based in Geneva. Uh, the choice of Switzerland was uh, because, you know, a lot of international organizations, uh, of course, are based there. And so we thought it would be like a, a really good thing to have a global, uh, a global place uh, to start this. Uh, they'll be in charge of the technical roadmap. Uh, and of course, this is an open source project. So, you know, you can already take the code base and fork it. In fact, you know, a number of people have done it. Uh, uh, founding members will start contributing I think all sort of different parts to the ecosystem and uh, you know when you think about what does the association need to do well first tier the the overall technological trajectory and evolution of the technology over time ensure that there's funding for all the kind of the shared infrastructure and things like R&D uh, on security on, on protocol upgrades and things like that uh, but also maintain that trust so management of that reserve and ensuring that you know, when people use the asset, they know that it's managed in the most conservative and, and rigorous way. Uh, there's a bunch of other details of how the reserve will interact with authorized resellers, exchanges, and everything else. But in the interest of time, I'll, I will pass. And um, uh, again, as you've seen, you know, there's been a number of feedback uh, coming from, from different regions, from different regulators, uh, and, and the association is very much in the phase of like, absorbing the feedback, iterating, and improving uh, on the design. <clears throat> which brings me uh, to, the, to the last dimension of trust, which is like, not only you need to trust that the ecosystem is reliable today, and that you can trust it and you should build maybe an application on top of it, you also need to be able to trust the dynamics of it, so the governance and the evolution of that ecosystem uh, over time. Now, why are the founding members needed? Well, the founding members are solving you know, the classic two-sided marketplace problem, or you know, also known as the chicken and egg problem, of having users on one side and applications on the other. So many of these are uh, really helping with last mile issues. Uh, so when you think about you know, why remittances, for example, are still so expensive, that last mile connecting you know, to a user uh, can be fairly expensive, especially in some regions uh, of the planet. Now, the, the irony is that, of course, many of these users have mobile phones or smartphones with data. And so there is a way to cross that last mile, uh, but then you also need to provide use cases for the coin, for example, be people being able to convert it back to their local fiat. And um, so these founding members are coming together to secure the network uh, in, in the phase where it's most vulnerable, right? So if you think about, you know, um, when is the network uh, really like not gonna be able to rely just on the fees that validators can collect, it's when the network is still small. And you know, in many proof of stake system, for example, there's this, you know the the famous problem of the not, nothing at stake problem. You can think of the role of the founding members as directly addressing that challenge. Uh, these are players that have a lot at stake, right? So and and they've been sorted because they have established reputation offline that can be ported uh, to build up and, and bootstrap the ecosystem. The the independence of the association in this framework is really important. It's really the main guarantee that even a competitor to one of the initial founding members can look at this and say, I should build on those rails because I can compete on the same terms. Uh, and so a strong and independent association is, is, is a key feature of the design. And that's why you know, the, the move is, is kind of unusual uh, in tech, which is after having incubated the project for, for so long, the project is now being passed to a governance structure where Facebook, as of today, already has only one of 21 votes uh, and, and one seat on, on the board at the moment. Why do you need distributed governance? I mean, this is, it, to this crowd, I think it's, it's, it's a very familiar concept. The idea is really to ensure that, you know, people can build on, on the same ecosystem. Otherwise, we would be recreating the same fragmentation that we see in payments uh, today. The, the other key role of the, the association is also ensuring that, you know, that public infrastructure, that shared infrastructure that everybody's building on can always be funded over time. I think this is a recurring problem. You know, again, I was mentioning the tragedy of the commons that we're seeing in some of the other networks where there's not always an incentive to ensure that the layer one is, is, is really built uh, and, and invested in uh, over, over the long run. And I think you know, people have been very creative with foundations and other nonprofits supporting kind of layer one and researching layer one, uh, but that's a recurring problem, I think, for, for most blockchain um, ecosystems. <clears throat> So project, again, as you know, was announced in 2019. There's a number of things happening right now. Uh, of course, the technology is being iterated and improved on. 
uh, the the idea of opening it up, of course, was like also to to make sure that you know it can uh, it can improve over time. Uh, the association has already taken over uh, the the governance role and also a number of work stream uh, that are really critical to to really building out uh, the the entire project. Um, and uh, I think you'll see over time an expansion, of course, of the membership group uh, that really will try to cover all the the parts that the ecosystem needs um, to to grow and build. And uh, as you know, with, with any innovation, of course, innovations typically don't fit into one particular regulatory category. And so part of the work right now is to, to really understand what are all the different regulatory requirements for the network to, to grow and scale and, and eventually to, to be deployed. And so that's kind of the, the part of the journey that, that the project is on. <clears throat> taking, taking really a step back, right, and I was talking about how many of the choices and trade-offs we made, uh, which, which were at time difficult, right? Because you, you have to des design the reserve in a certain way versus another, uh, you have to make some choices. And, and in a sense, what was really important to us throughout the journey was keeping in mind what, what the problem was. What is the, the kind of thing that we were trying to solve? Uh, if you look at some of the data, there's about 1.7 billion people uh, today without a bank account. Okay, so that, that's an astounding number. And it doesn't even include people that are severely underbanked or completely unbanked, uh, even in countries like the United States, uh, or that are being charged sometimes very high fees for some of the services that wealthier segments of the population either get for free because they're more profitable uh, or, 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 you know, uh, are getting, again, on, on slightly better terms. Now, what's interesting about this figure is that the vast majority of that uh, population has access to a smartphone. And, and again, think about, you know, it could be a $30 uh, Android device, and, and that's really the on and off ramp between uh, the offline world and the digital one. Uh, and so the, the promise of a network like Libra is really trying to, to make progress towards crossing that last mile and, and using this population of users that uh, are currently excluded from the, from the financial system. And I think people often do want to admit that part of the exclusion is really high prices. Uh, the cost of accessing many uh, of these payment services and some of these different financial services over time it, is really borne uh, by these users. And so that's, that's why they're excluded. It's not that they don't have technically, they, they may have potentially have access, uh, but they may not use it because it's simply too expensive to them. So the goal, again, of the Libra network is, is to work in crossing that last mile friction and in building over time a network that can really deliver a safe, secure, and reliable uh, payment uh, functionality across different jurisdictions. Uh, I think we've seen a lot of progress in a number of countries, but many of these are kind of limited to that, that single region, right? So there's been progress, for example, in Europe around payments, and, and now you can have fairly efficient payments, similar in, in, in India, uh, where you know, have unified payment solutions that have lowered the cost dramatically. The, the, the challenge is that many of these systems don't talk to each other. And so part of the goal of Libra is really to be the glue between these different systems and allow you to, to move value as effectively as possible uh, between those different regions. Uh, so I, I, I hope this was a, a useful overview of some of the uh, you know, basic principles behind uh, the, the design of Libra. Uh, again, I didn't have enough time to go into a lot of detail, I think, about many of the economic features. Um, this is very much a work in progress. Uh, you know, we, we welcome feedback uh, from uh, all sort of different areas of our expertise. Uh, you know, the, the whole point of announcing this uh, in June, uh, which was sort of misinterpreted as a launch, but you know, we, we didn't really launch. We, we, we released some code, we released some ideas. Um, and, and the idea was really to gather feedback and, and make sure that you know, that evolution of that network uh, can be shaped uh, for, for really achieving the mission of financial inclusion uh, over, the, over the long run. So that's it. Thank you very much. <clears throat>